Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 634, that's 634 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you, I hope you are doing well. How am I? You know how it is, nice and hydrated, I've just been barbered up in things, you know the vibe, feeling good, feeling clean, feeling alive. Talking about being barbered up, talking about being barbered up, the recession and the rising cost of living has definitely hit me in the wallet, because back in the day, I remember when we used to pay a tenner for haircuts, there were even times where depending on where you'd go, you could get a haircut for a fiver, five pounds. Then, of course, you know, you, you cross over that threshold of 15 or your limbs start to grow a little bit longer, usually, especially if you're in a Caribbean barbershop. They don't play none of those games. They don't care what age you are in a passport. If you are if you have to duck your head as you're walking in the door, you have to pay, t- you have to pay 10 to 20 pounds. And that was the standard price for a long time. I, I felt like barbershop prices have been froze have been frozen at 20 quid for ages and it's only in the last few years or maybe the last couple of years that we've seen the advent of these new trendy type of barbers like there's one that i went to in west london called f for fade that i had to stop going to because it was just too far i was traveling to flipping stanmore i live on one side of east london and i was traveling all the way to the other side of of, of london like the west so basically it would take me like an hour and 10 minutes door to door sometimes an hour and 20 to get this haircut a place called f for fade and um, that was one of those first kind of Americanized style, you know, to borrow the term from DSP barbershops where they would cut your fade. They'd, they'd give you a fade like Odell Beckham level. You know, it'd be HD, it'd be a pristine. They'd go over it with a blade. They'd, they'd do all these other extra bits and bobs you didn't really get usually if you went to the barbershop and ends. And the quality was just better, in it? The standard was better. So maybe the, the guys that were doing it, maybe went to college or they just studied or they did an apprenticeship. I don't know, whatever. That was always quite handy. But that was the only time I remember seeing a little bit of a price increase in the in the in the haircuts. Because they start charging twenty five thirty, sometimes forty fifty, right? Depending on what you wanted to get. You could go there and the good thing about those kind of places is that usually they had everything all in the house. So if you wanted to get braids and you also wanted to get some fade and you wanted to get your beard trimmed, you could get it all done in the same place. And you could book it and sometimes the the benefit of it also is that you could book them online or they'd have apps. There's this other brand, I forgot the name of it though. Um I think it's Clip or something. I forgot the name of it. There's other dude, other dude who's got another barber shop in East London, actually, um, around Hackney that I went to once. And the day that I went there, actually, funny enough, my favorite MC of all time, Dizzy Rascal, was in there. And I had to kind of act like I didn't see him or act like I didn't know who he was because that's what we do in London, isn't it? We don't beg anyone really, unless they're DJs. That's the weird thing with this in this country. We leave people alone for the most part, but unless they're DJs, we kind of go over and bother them and try and make them feel special. And then when they root us, we're, so we're surprised. It's like, come on, man, you're gassing them up in it. That's the thing. Leave them alone. But I went to that Hackney Barbershop and I saw this rascal there. And that one was another barbershop that was around right the 30 mark. But for the most part, all of my barbershops and ends have been stick, stuck around that 20 pound mark for ages. And just the other day when I went to go get my hair cut, unfortunately my barber informed me when i handed him over the 20 pound he was like oh, i just want to let you know that like, whispered that you know the prices have gone up it's 25 now but i'll let you off for this time so make sure remember next time i was like no way so I thought, you know what let me just get my money out so obviously you know barber shops are, are smart because 25 is not 30 so usually you can keep people on board and also when you take out money from a cash point in the in the uk you know, for the most part unless it's a cash point that's outside of a royal mail post office most cash points don't give you fivers so they only give you money in 10 increments so you take out 10 you're not going to be standing there giving them a 10 waiting for change like an absolute donut you're just going to give it to them, tell them to keep the keep the change as, as a tip which you never usually do for barbers in london i feel like some people do maybe if you're like a Maybe if you're a shot or something, or you, you know what I mean? Or, or you're one of those um, scammer types. Maybe you have so much cash that you don't know what to do with it. You're trying to move a tips. But you rarely see people give people tips for the most part, barbers. I don't know. I don't really usually see it. Um, so now that's become a thing. Now I'm paying more. So I paid £30 for my haircut, my beard trim. So not, not happy. You know, not the standard is obviously decent for end sort of stuff. It's not too bad. I, I, I'm a fan of it. But it's now basically 25 pound plus five pound tip so 
<sighs> making it difficult. So now, so now when I'm getting my whole thing done, when I'm getting my braids and my fade and my beard, it's basically 60 quid. I go to one auntie to get my hair braided and get them in cornrows and whatnot. And then I go to this guy around the corner to go get my hair cut down and my beard done. So it takes, it's like 60 quid to get myself looking nice and cute. It's a lot. It's not as much as, uh, as the ladies out there, but it's still a lot for a dude to spend 60 quid to keep himself ready to go. It's a lot out there, but what can you do, innit? What can you do? It is what it is. Um, I read or no, I heard Elon Musk say the other day on some podcast that he expects the recession to ease off, um, I think he said first quarter of 2024. That's what they're, that's what they're, that's what they're hypothesizing. All the people that, you know, are way smarter than you or I, or have their finger on the pulse when it comes to stocks and markets and finance and whatnot. They're saying, uh, at the, at the earliest, we're looking at Q4 2023 and at the latest, we're looking at Q1, Q2 2024. So hopefully by that time, things will ease up. It will go back down to the twenty pounds, which probably won't happen anyway. It'll be like um, it'll be like how it is now with tuition fees. Remember when the tuition fees went up in the UK, and uh, and they were like, oh, we're gonna set a parameter or like a guideline, and we're gonna tell people that they can charge up to ten thousand pounds. Obviously, every university saw that and said, yeah, of course we're gonna charge ten thousand. We're not gonna do up to. We're gonna do ten thousand exactly. So that ends up happening. It is what it is, isn't it? What can you do? What can you do? Apart from that, what's been happening? Um, Christmas was pretty good, to be fair. Spending time with the family is always nice. Um, you know, all the the Christmas sort of like excitement for presents and stuff it dies completely when you're over the age of eighteen and you can basically buy your own presents. It doesn't necessarily matter anymore. It's more time to just kind of spend time with the fam, bust some joke, watch some YouTube channels, argue about politics and world affairs and all that good stuff, and just kind of leave it at that. A little bit of drinking, a little bit of eating. This time around, I I um I did semi well trying to kind of bring a peace offering with me because I hadn't seen my parents in a long time. So I made sure to bring some um little turkey strippers that I'm usually quite good at making for some reason. I tend to kind of um marinate and season the turkey pretty well and make it quite succulent, even though turkey does kind of you know dry out pretty quickly but i do like the texture of it and the taste of turkey a lot better than chicken especially here in the uk the chicken here you know for the butchers is not the best um quality you're going to get so i definitely opt to get for the turkey and that was pretty decent i followed a couple of um, recipes and whatnot instructions on youtube and it turned out pretty good everyone's pretty happy with it and i think when i left the whole containers or two little tupperwares i bought with the turkeys were completely finished so that was a pretty good little um review for me because i've never really been much of a cook in the slightest so to have people legitimately like fighting over the little chicken strips i make i was like yeah that's a big success so that was really nice and um that was that was it for the most part just been doing that hanging around chilling so yeah i hope you guys all had a good christmas and probably do the same thing that I did, hanging around the family, eating, drinking and whatnot. Even if you weren't with family, it definitely is a time just to reflect. I think the older you get, Christmas ends up being a little bit like New Year's too. I think when you're younger, you see Christmas as like a time to like, you know, excess eating, going crazy. And you also see the same thing with New Year's Eve. Like about one time to go nuts. Yeah, yeah, all, all better off. Project X, we're going to relive it, all this sort of stuff. But then as soon as you get a little bit older, even if you're on your own, you don't have much family. It's just a time to reflect, really. Just to sit with your own thoughts and kind of reflect on the year reflect on the things that you're thankful kind of it's kind of weirdly enough the uk version of thanksgiving in a weird way i know really we shouldn't be but it's kind of a time for you to sort of like um to think outside of yourself you know you're not the center of the universe anymore think about how you can maybe contribute to to the world to your local local community to society at large whatever it may be and new year's eve is probably the same sort of vibe you usually kind of sit down and think you know what this is what I'm about. This is what I'm heading into the new year with. This is the energy that I'm on. This is the vibe that I'm trying to attract. Um, or this is the vibes that I'm trying to keep away from me. All this sort of good stuff happens. So, yeah, man, um, I enjoyed it. it was a brilliant time to spend with the fam. And, yeah, looking forward to the next one, innit? Looking forward to the next one. But, yeah, let's move on to the pod. We've got many things to talk about. Don't want to waste much of your time. So, let's just dive right on into it. Number one topic I want to get into, which is really distressing news for me, especially considering that I'm a big fan of the guy and have known him from afar, tangentially through different people um, in the scene and whatnot, is this story, courtesy of an account called Kanye Defence Team that says as follows, long-time gay collaborator, Philophis London and producer, has apparently been missing since July and people are concerned. Spread the word. I know he follows this page, so if you see this, just give me a like to let us know you're good, at Theophilus London. 
So as I've read there, Fiofis London, a long-time collaborator with Ye and all manner of people in the scene and somebody who's been at the forefront of kind of pushing that alternative, um, you know, whatever, what, how would you call it even? That just the, the image of, alone of him being like a tall black skinny dude who kind of sung these amazing synth pop indie dance type records back in the day was really, really forward thinking. Probably somebody that probably deserves to have a lot more success than they did have considering, you know, the influence that he had on, you know, culture and art on music on fashion. I still remember how obsessed Karl Lagerfeld was, him, was with him when he was, um, you know, at the head of Chanel and whatnot and just generally being a, a kind of cultural touch point for loads of really cool things you think of the lovers hats back in the day you think of you know his ability to essentially single-handedly drive up the stock of or drive up demand for the jordan 5 black metallics um just loads of different things that he's done in culture over over the time and um, you kind of feel like he didn't really get the flowers that he deserved when he was you know around and popping but regardless this is really concerning news because i have from what i've known of the guy from afar i do know that he has a uh, tendency to go dark and to go off grid and most of the times he does that when he comes back he pops up again with a new style with a new aesthetic with a new sound with a new outlook on life maybe with a new partner but he's always kind of doing that kind of going off grid for a while and then coming back again and it's sort of like he's got kind of way of kind of keeping himself on the front foot and reinvent himself and whatnot but i guess the issue with this particular post as i've been reading around on twitter is that i think he always checks in with a couple of people in his life maybe it's his family maybe it's his friends but there's always people he kind of checks in on and they kind of know that he's okay and in this case with it being the holidays and you know you know and then over christmas and whatnot the fact that he hasn't checked in with anybody has been really concerning so they didn't hear from him from july which is maybe okay in some way shape or form because they know him as a person can go dark and go off grid but for him to not say anything over the holidays has been really really out of the blue and people are concerned naturally um so hopefully this is just a case of him being in some silent retreat somewhere um getting his mind right or whatever it may be or traveling in some far-flung place where he's basically you know removed himself from social media and having a phone or whatnot but whatever the case may be hopefully someone out there does see this post and is able to kind of you know get in touch with him and let him know that his family and friends are out there looking for him because the last thing we want to know is somebody as important to culture as office london is to have anything bad happening towards the end of the year that's just be a horrible way to kind of end the year especially after all the madness has been going on um throughout it but i'm hoping for the best i'm really i'm hoping and praying for the best and everything's okay um that everything's nice and, and, and dandy going forward but it really is a sad indictment also in the scene in it like unfortunately i think i was speaking about this myself recently um I think concerning what I was speaking about. I think I was thinking about with my club nights that I used to do back in the day in like Dawson and whatnot in East London. Some of you may have come to a few of them, you know, stuff like So Special and whatnot that was doing pretty decently at the time when I was kind of doing it. But, you know, nothing that was really pushing culture that way forward. But I still played a role in kind of dictating, you know, some trends in nightlife at a time or whatnot, just kind of taking part, whatever it may be. Who cares? Right? It's just a flipping club now. Who gives a fuck? But what I remember looking at those pictures, because I was going through a few pictures the other day and kind of scanning through some old stuff and thinking about putting some throwback Friday things up. And I was thinking, you know what, actually, that's horrible because it just looks like you're kind of pining and holding on for yesteryears. Well, not, it's not really the fact. I'm just kind of sharing them because I like the core cool pictures. But it does come across like you're kind of missing out on the time that you were quote unquote cool. And now that you're expired, you're trying to relive those kind of glory years through these pictures you just to just try to make new experiences as opposed to kind of live you know off of the flames of yesteryears but anyway i digress what i didn't notice on those pictures is how many people were around me i noticed so many people in my orbit like standing to the left to the right behind people off camera you could just feel that i was constantly surrounded by people and these are people that were working in cool jobs that maybe were associated with cool people that had cool things that they were doing themselves it was all these amazing creative people who were just kind of all around me and trying to basically you know get in my orbit and i was trying to maybe get into their orbit and it was just like a free exchange of clout that was happening at the time and it was all done under the guise of like that's my brother that's my sister that's my friend that's my co -D, that's my this that's my that when really that was never the truth because now I can count on one hand the amount of people from those years 
that I speak to now or we're in we're in any kind of cordial relationship with. Not that not that we've fallen out, but in the in effect of like, you know, I don't know zero about what's going on in their life and they probably know zero about what's going on in mine because I don't even share crap on social media. So that's the really odd thing about it is that there are moments in your life, especially when you're in the kind of, you know, creative scene or whatnot, or wherever you're from, where you feel like you're at the center of the earth. Like you feel like you're, you're, you're in the center of all of it. Everyone's kind of around you. You feel like you're in the heart and the thick of it. You feel like you're kind of taking part. You're active. Uh, you're participating. And then soon, especially if you don't take advantage of the situation you're in and you don't try to capitalize and build from it, it just goes away. And it never comes back again. And those same people that you thought were really your friends aren't really your friends because they stopped checking in on you because, you know, you're not really of any benefit to them any way, shape or form. And I got the same sort of feeling when I saw that post of Fear First London. Like, he hasn't been seen since July. Now, that could be an exaggeration. That could be some people haven't seen him since July. Maybe his family members have seen him on FaceTime in June or whatever. But the fact that no one went out of their way to try and find out if he was cool since July is a real bad indictment on just how um, surface level, how fake everything is in the scene when it comes to relationships. Like there is no, it, it doesn't exist. This whole like brotherhood, sisterhood, friendship thing, it's all circumstantial based. It's all based on like what you have, um, what you can provide people. Like be under no illusions. These people are not your friends because when it comes down to it, in moments like this, you see what real friendship looks like and real friendship wouldn't allow you to let somebody who you know and love to go missing for six months. Even if they go missing of their own volition, even if it's like Davis London pur- purposely retracted himself from society like because i know i did that in the scene when i was popping and doing my thing in the scene i purposely pulled away maybe because i kind of felt like i would never really adapt to it cool that could be a good reason maybe because i felt like no one liked me maybe who knows but i do feel like i took the first step to kind of pull away even though i could have tried to like hold on and did that whole thing because a lot of people in the scene who ended up being successful some of them were successful because of their talent and their skill and their hard work and their ability to network and whatnot but some of them are also successful because they were just persistent they just had they just never gave up they just no sorry well they never gave up and they just didn't leave they just stayed. So the guys who were photographers at events, they're still doing pictures now and getting invited to all these kind of things. The guys that were, you know, um, doing flipping producing and assisting on sets and stuff, they're still doing it. Because if you just hang around long enough and you don't leave and you're somewhat reliable, sooner rather than later, your chance will come to show and prove and you'll be able to get a job and you're there kind of solidified. But if you're like me and you kind of get a little bit um, disillusioned by the scene, you get kind of pissed off with people's personalities. You don't feel like you can lick art, all this sort of stuff. You start playing all these weird mind games in your head. It's very difficult to stay and be present because you're kind of constantly thinking in the back of your head that you're coming across like a waste man. You should be doing your own thing. Uh, all this sort of nonsense narrative. So for me, I didn't want to stay like that. I didn't want to, you know, some people, when you're working in the workplace, when someone doesn't want to be there, there could be a negative, you know, influence on the workplace. They're coming in late. They're always stroppy. They're always mumbling under their breath. They're always trying to get you involved in their conspiracy about how bad this workplace is. You just want to work and cash a check and go home. So I'm that kind of person who's like, if I have that kind of attitude, I just leave. I do it all the time. I just, as soon as I'm not feeling the place I'm at, as soon as I'm kind of trying to get a bit disillusioned or I feel like I've maybe surpassed a level that I'm at, and even if it can be, you know, um, even if it is a little bit of an ego thing, I immediately pull myself away from it because I don't want to be a negative influence. And I feel like I did that in the scene. I kind of like, you know what? I don't want to turn into somebody that I'm not ever going to be or or that I would hate to be. I'd rather kind of pull myself away from it. And I did that on purpose. Fair enough. But I'm nowhere near the celebrity of Surface London. I'm nowhere near the level of clout that he ever had. So the fact that he can pull away and no one can go and check in on him is really concerning. Really, really concerning. And it kind of does, like again, show how surface level and how fake those relationships and friendships are because i'm sure he's hooked up many people he's sorted out many people with different roles and positions um just with looks and just you know just standing next to the guy being in his orbit all this sort of stuff has basically allowed people to go in you know and go and further their career and in the moment of darkness or in a moment where he maybe might need some support maybe it's just a cry for help whatever it may be 
no one's there for him until a random person puts a post up on Instagram and then suddenly everyone remembers, myself included. Oh yeah, Fluffy Thunder's around. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a close friend, but still, do you know what I mean? That, that That's the really concerning part about all of that sort of stuff. It's really eye-opening to that extent of like, no one really cares for you in that regard. Like, just just make the best of it while you can in the moment you're in, especially if you're in the light. Because I think we all get this, we all get this moment in our lives where the kind of, the spotlight kind of shines on us. It's probably your duty when the spotlight is on you to kind of make the most of it and bring all your friends that you want, especially your actual friends, people that you actually love, and bring them under your arms and kind of have them standing, un, you know, beside you, basking in that light and allow them to kind of take that light and then kind of give it to other people, blah, blah, blah. But you also have to know that soon that light will kind of pass over you and go to somebody else. So you can't take it for granted. And don't also think the people that are in that light under, under you are going to be there forever. Some of them are just there temporarily to kind of bask in that light and to get a little bit of that juice and kind of take it elsewhere. Some of them are going to be long-time friends, wherever it may be, but just know it's very temporary, very temporary, which is probably why it's really important to have a very balanced and fulfilled life outside of the scene. Because if you think those guys in the scene are your friends, you're going to be in for a rude awakening once, you be, once you're not cool or relevant anymore. Because that does happen to everybody. Everyone has a moment where you're not necessarily the main guy or girl anymore. And either it's by force or by the way of the industry, you'll start to realize it. And then sooner rather than later, you have to kind of pivot and do other things or you end up being one of those people that don't accept it. And you're you know still there at these flipping private views wearing 700 pound trainers and trying to fit in with the cool kids. It's like, it's a bit sad, but hey, um, hoping everything's good with the office London, I really do, and hopefully he's found safe and well, and it's just like a, you know, communication misunderstanding type of thing, that's my hope, really, really is my hope. Oh yeah, sorry to continue on the bad news tip, but this story also came across my timeline, and I thought I'd basically speak on it, because it's really distressing, and it's something that, for me, would be an absolute nightmare. It's a complete contrast or the complete opposite of what um, nights out with your friends should be like. But this is courtesy of Birmingham Police. And it says, we've launched a murder investigation after a man was stabbed to death on a dance of a Birmingham nightclub. We were called to the Crane nightclub in Digbeth last night. Did you see what happened? We need your help. And then the full story of the situation is available here via Sky News. It says a man, 23 years old only, my absolute baby. Police were called to the Crane nightclub just before 11.45 p.m. on Boxing Day. Despite efforts to save the man, he was pronounced dead around half an hour later. Um, so he basically died on the dance floor. Jesus Christ. West Berlin Police said a number of murder investigations have been launched. Officers were called to the Crane nightclub um, on Alderley Street, Digbeth, at 11.45 p.m. Despite efforts to save him, he was pronounced dead around half an hour later. Officer says the man had been on a night out with friends when he was approached by a group of people, um, according to the West Midlands Police. Police said hundreds of people were in the tennis and nightclub at the time of the stabbing. The tennis are viewing CCTV from the nightclub and urged anyone who was with the, in the area to get in touch. Speaking from the scene, Sky's Becky Johnson said the nightclub has only been open for a few months. It's a new nightclub. Jesus Christos. A man who was working at the club on a night but did not witness a stabbing described the aftermath to her as an absolute mayhem as people ran out of the club when they realized someone had been stabbed. Detective Inspector Michelle Fergard, who's leading the investigation, said, This is a young man enjoying himself with friends on Boxing Day night out and our thoughts are with his friends and family today. We know there are hundreds of people in the nightclub at the time. While we've spoken to a number of them already, we still need to hear from anybody who was there and who witnessed or even heard what happened. God almighty. We believe that the victim was approached by a group of people had been st and was then stabbed. So we're working to hard to identify those who were involved. The victim's family has been told and will be supported by specialist officers. The office force said the scene remains closed while the evidence is gathered and neighborhood officers will be patrolling the area over the coming days to offer reassurance, police have said absolutely tragic and of course um the news of it has obviously spread all across um social media and until now the conf again this is people on your social media but from what i've been seeing on there uh, it's regarding this young guy here called cody and everyone's been saying r.i.p cody on, on my side as you can see it's trending here in the uk so this might be the guy or the, or the younger lad that unfortunately passed away at the nightclub in birmingham absolutely tragic affair absolutely absolutely tragic affair and um i don't know man like these things are super distressing for me personally, especially somebody that's a you know huge fan of going to clubs and nightlife in general and whatnot. 
this is essentially my nightmare scenario you're going out to a place with your friends um to go and celebrate to have a good time to enjoy yourself and whatnot and you end up in a situation like this is legitimately legitimately a nightmare and unfortunately this is kind of one of the um one of the one of the harsh realities of going out like there are so many dodgy characters outside um outside of your control especially that you have to kind of navigate around to have a good time you always kind of have to be on your p's and q's and you can't really ever have your guard down you always have to kind of keep your head in a swivel which is again the opposite of what it should feel like going on a night out with your friends you should be able to let your hair down you should be able to disconnect from everyday life and essentially be able to throw yourself in whatever scenario you're in and have a jolly good time with your friends and your family and sometimes with pure strangers it'd be nice that i've gone out and you've met somebody on a dance floor especially off a pinger or something and you legitimately think that person's your best friend and you're planning opening a cafe or going to a festival of all together with them and it turns into an absolutely barnstorm of a night and it happens all the bloody time and i don't know man when events like this happen i just think to myself like what kind of energy are you bringing to a dance floor where you want to get into a situation where this is happening because unless these guys knew each other prior there's no other reason why this should have escalated this level even if it's just like an argument which does happen sometimes you bumped me your drink spilled over my shoe because in the uk we don't necessarily tolerate a lot of kind of um a lot of that kind of personal space type of violations it's not really a violation but we have a very um short fuse for those type of things it really is on you the violator to kind of um you know keep that situation under uh, you know under somewhat of a control and not let it go crazy like if you bump into somebody the onus is on you to make sure that you let them know that it was an accident and then as soon as you're able to kind of do that you can quickly diffuse the situation and it can go back to all laughs and giggles and whatnot it can do that pretty pretty quickly but if you react strongly or if you have a certain look on your face or if they interpret your movements a bit intimidating or aggressive it can just go from zero to 100 really quickly and again i wasn't there i don't know what occurred but i'm just kind of you know speaking from other past experiences but regardless even if that was the case surely as i've mentioned other times when it comes to like um situations in america where for some reason they always tend to go to lethal force and pulling out guns why is it here in the uk young lads can't have altercations that just result in them fighting like back in the day just having a punch-up someone gets punched up you leave with a black eye or something or bruised ribs or whatnot or you get rushed and you go home why can't that ever happen? Why does it always have to result in somebody pulling out a knife, you know, like, or using a sharp object to hurt? It's like, why does it always have to be lethal? That's the thing I don't understand because I can understand having an annoyance with somebody. They spill something on your drink. They spilled your drink on, you know, on, on your Dior shoes. They bumped into you. You, you, you kind of stained their essentials hoodie. Whatever. Cool. I understand why you'd get angry about that sort of stuff because those things mean a lot to you. You tie a lot of your self-worth to the things that you're wearing because I'm from that area, right? I'm from ends. I know what it's like. I'm not like me taking a piss. I understand what that's about. You're going out on a night out. You want to flex. You want to you want to impress. You want to stunt on the boys. You want to impress the girls. It makes some sense why you'd be a little bit more emotional if somebody touched or messed about with your stuff it makes complete sense but why can't we just have a punch-up why can't we fight why can't we settle our differences that way instead of always going to lethal force where somebody's moms have to cry where somebody's brothers sisters children are going to go without fathers and whatnot boyfriends girlfriends are going to go without partners why does it have to go to that extent that's the thing that really breaks my heart it really does break my heart in that way because I don't ever think there's any scenario, especially in a nightclub, that should result in lethal force unless it's prior beef that you're bringing into that space, which again, you shouldn't do. I feel like if you've got beef with somebody, I feel like nightclub should always be neutral territory, much like a much like a school. If you're going to go pick up your kid at a school and you bumped into an op, it shouldn't be on site in the school. It shouldn't be. It should be off limits. With your school, with your family, in a nightclub, it should be off limits. Even if it's a nightclub, it should be, okay, cool, let's go outside. Because one thing you don't want to do, you don't want to ruin that club as well and have that club be forced to close. Because this club has only been open recently. And if you know anything about the UK, you'll know when it comes to our ability to deal with troubling situations around nightlife, we don't deal with them well at all. The, the quickest thing to deal with it is to, you know, suspend licenses, take away licenses or close down or have them relaunch as a flipping quasi food hall, bar, gastro pub sort of nonsense. That's all we do. 
we just end up closing. We never ever, you know, mediate with the owners of the clubs or the local council or the people that are representing some of the youth in there and try and figure out solutions so that this doesn't happen again. It's all just closing. So usually if you are somebody that's on smoke, you would know that in the back of your mind or just because, you know, you're from an area where there's not many good clubs. You'd be like, no, no, let's not ruin this place. Let's step outside. It's sort of like if you bumped into an op at a house party. You're not going to smash up your boy's house party because of op's in there. You're going to be like, hey, let's go outside and, st and settle our differences so we don't, you know, mash up my boy's crib or whatnot and you know that didn't obviously happen in this in this scenario but what an absolutely horrible situation you know to deal with i can't imagine how you know his friends and family are having to handle this especially again during the festive time um if there's ever a worse time for somebody to pass away in these sort of occasions i always feel like it's a festive time because i feel like no matter what your socioeconomic level is these are always occasions where even if you even if you legitimately don't have much family whoever you you're close to you try to get close to them right i've heard of people especially immigrants who have their own kind of version of christmas holidays where they all kind of gather around at one person's house and they exchange presents and whatnot just so they can feel like they're together and not going to be alone during a time when everyone's kind of with family so this is a time when you're kind of constantly thinking about your relatives constantly thinking about your family members your close friends and to lose somebody in those such track of circumstances especially considering how jubilant he must have been leaving the house to go and party to go and hang out with friends and now suddenly you're having to you know hear the most distressing news ever the next day i can't imagine man i can't imagine so r.i.p cody um r.i.p um to him thoughts and feelings go out to all his family and friends connected to this story and hopefully a resolution gets met at the end of this hopefully a resolution gets met at the end of this one can only hope man one can only hope when the whole balenciaga kids campaign thing broke and a lot of people on social media were really going at Kim Kardashian specifically and basically forcing her and other members of her family to come out and make some sort of statement to disavow Balenciaga for that very tasteless and crude and maybe tone deaf kids campaign. Well, I didn't think it was entirely sadistic. I don't think it was all the way, you know, um, you know, all the way a sigh up for child molestation as some of the people on the right were thinking but it definitely was distasteful and definitely was something that they probably had to answer for and apologize for and make right for sure but is it means for them to be permanently cancelled cancelled us sorry i don't think so but still i think a lot of people had some interesting and somewhat nuanced opinions about it but i felt like the demand to have kim kardashian comment on it was pretty well placed i don't feel like you should want to demand anything for celebrity. They, 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 shouldn't want, they shouldn't need to answer for anything they do. But I feel like with somebody like a Kim who's trying to, at the moment, it feels like she's trying to LARP as a single mom of four who's working her ass off and running a business and running a household. That whole kind of LARP and cosplay that she's doing at the moment, I think it's adequate and fair to ask that person who's pretending to be a single mom, hey, if this brand that you're working with, your close relationship with, is involved in such a dodgy activity as kind of you know maybe exploiting kids or putting them in harm's way in these kind of crazy campaigns you should really have something to say about it especially if you're trying to lap as a single mom and it took her ages to come out with a comment and when she did come out with a comment she essentially said nothing she essentially said hey um i clearly don't you know condone you know anything involving kids that puts kids in harm's way or anything could involve in abuse or whatnot um and i'm taking stock on my relationship with Balenciaga, and that was it but there was no distancing in terms of saying hey this is the end i'm not going to work with them anymore nothing along those kind of lines is like i'm going to leave the door open we're going to have an investigation internally and we're going to get to the bottom of it and make sure this doesn't happen again something vague and stupid like that and i remember the time when i was listening to it i thought to myself that's an interesting and a weird position to have because i would have thought to myself like i know these guys are soulless and don't really have any principles or morals because i think in general to be as successful as they are as family you can't really be tied down to silly and kind of frivolous things as principles morals and ethics if you want to be the kardashian it doesn't necessarily exist but i would have thought like many people when they have kids there's this common line everyone have right? Right, the kids changed me now i'm serious about x y and z now i'm not taking no prisoners i'm everything i do for my children even if it's just like um even if it's just 
uh, things that you say to appear like a good person. I feel like a lot of people generally do have that switch. Once they have a, they're a kid, once they have a family, suddenly things start to be, uh, you know, suddenly the focus becomes lasered, lasered in. There's no distractions. Um, they're very clear in what they want to do and what they don't want to do. Um, there's no kind of frivolous activities. Any, any time free they have, they spend with their kids, all this sort of stuff, right? It becomes that sort of switch that goes on in their heads. But also you think sometimes with some women in Hollywood, there's a kind of protective side of things where it's like anything that concerns kids or any kind of things that can be viewed a bit dodgy, they'll just completely cross it out. There's no time for it. And they'll kind of draw a line in the sand. Like, this is where I am and this is what I kind of stand on. And I would have thought, me naively, oh, okay, this is where Kim's going to draw a line in the sand and really solidify this LARP that she's doing as a single mom of four. Instead, she didn't. She made excuses and kind of danced around it. And I feel like this clip here taken from the Angie Martinez interview that Kim did recently is another one that kind of highlights just how disconnected from reality these people are and just the lack of principles, morals, ethics and the ability to draw a line in the sand and say, here's where I stand. There is no such line in the sand. As soon as money is involved, as soon as prestige is involved, marketing and all this sort of stuff is involved, lines in the sands get blurred or there just generally isn't one. It's very loose. It's very vague. It's very flexible. It's very opaque. Let's just call it that way. And this is kind of Kim Kardashian's impression of the whole thing. And I thought it was very, very, very funny considering everything that happened. So I think the clip is somewhere around the 1528 mark, if I'm not mistaken. But this is a clip taken from the Angela Martinez interview. I really recommend checking it out because it's fascinating to hear her speak and kind of, you know, try and sound like somewhat of a normal person. Because, you know, when you watch the first minute or so of it, I'm not sure if it's the editing, but she doesn't blink, it feels like. She's just like a stone face. It feels like there might be a little bit of video editing software going on and the hollowing out of her cheeks. I'm not too sure if that's me or Cordia or somebody else, but hey, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. And it just generally just feels like you're talking to a bit of a cyborg. There's not much kind of soul or emotion coming out of her, which is maybe how her personality is, as a, you know, as a person, who knows. But I thought this interpretation that she had of why people responded negatively to her Balenciaga comments was super, super interesting because she completely missed the mark. But let's let's play the clip and you can hear what she says and I'll give you my opinion on the other side. And you asked me about like the grace. Mm -hmm. I, one day, my kids will thank me mm -hmm. for not sitting here and like bashing their dad when I could. Mm -hmm. You know, like, of course, all the crazy shit. That's, you know, not just me. It, like, it kills me for my family. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, I can handle it. But like... They'll thank me mm -hmm. and I will be, I'll privately answer anything that they want to know. Mm -hmm. But it's not my place anymore to really like jump in. And sometimes obviously I have to, but then. I wonder if that was the real reason why the divorce wasn't as protracted as it probably seemed it was going to be. Because I felt like Kanye was firing lawyers every single week, it felt like. And then suddenly it just got, you know, pushed over the line and it got signed and everything got, you know, done. You know, I's dotted, T's crossed pretty quickly. I wonder if that was one of the reasons why. Like she just wanted rid of the association with Kanye as soon as possible so that she didn't have to be his spokesperson like or his translator like, oh no what Kanye meant was this because that's what she did when they were together together right there'll be a lot of her trying to clarify certain points of view or whatnot but as soon as that happened you've really if ever heard her speak directly about him or even mention his name that's the interesting part you don't really hear him, her even mention his name you hear her say the kid's dad but you don't ever say yay Kanye like, she, does, she kind of steers away from even talking about him in that regard so maybe that was the whole point of it let's just rush this divorce through get it over the line so I don't have to comment on anything more that he does because everything that he does that's negative it also puts smut on my name by default maybe who knows sometimes I'm like wait a minute I posted something in support of the Jewish community or like even with the Balenciaga thing it was like, everyone was like, why aren't you speaking out? Why aren't you speaking out? And I'm like, wait, I'm not in this campaign. I don't know what's happening. Let me like take a minute to research this. And then as soon as I... Honestly, what a dummy. 
No one was attacking you because you're not in the camp. We know you weren't in the campaign. That's pretty clear. The issue was you are one of the premier, maybe second only to Kanye. Maybe you and Kanye are joint one and two in terms of being the ambassadors for Balenciaga, right? Demna designed your Met Gala outfit, right? You are, have a very close relationship with Balenciaga to the point where your entire family are decked out with Balenciaga at, at certain times of the year. Same thing goes with Kanye. He legitimately spends a lot of money on that stuff. I think he said last of time of speaking, he spent, what is it, $4 million up to on flipping Balenciaga. So clearly, it would make sense why people would be coming to the one and two people who are associated with the brand and asking, hey, What's the deal with this stuff that's going on here with them allegedly promoting SA with children or whatnot or just putting children in weird situations with whatever bears that they were holding and the associ- and the kind of correlation to those bears and what they kind of represent, blah, 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 blah. It's within reason for them to ask somebody who's, again, trying to LARP as a single mum of four why they haven't made a public comment about something as um, sensitive and downright abhorrent why wouldn't you make a comment about it it's not because you're not in it it's because you're a mum it's because you're one of the faces of Balenciaga it makes complete sense people ask you that question but again it's this kind of willful obfuscation of the facts or maybe it's just weird clueless naivete or just an inability to live in the actual real world that she generally doesn't understand but i'm not in the campaign it's like yeah we know you're not in the campaign but you're a mum and you're flipping the literally the brand ambassador for the for the flipping brand of course we'd ask you of course we'd ask you we're obviously not going to get anything substantial or anything of merit from your answers fair enough but it makes sense why people would ask you and wonder hey would she have a principled nuanced um ethical reason to maybe draw a line in the sand and say you know what i'm not gonna represent this enough is enough or will she just make excuses and skirt around it as per usual? And we obviously got our answer. I saw what everyone was seeing on the internet and the reality of the situation. I completely spoke out and gave my my thoughts on child porn and completely denounced it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but because I didn't say, fuck you, Balenciaga, that's it. People got mad at that. So it's like, I'm, they're mad if I, I don't speak out. <laughs> they're mad if I do speak out and if I don't cancel. Mm-hmm. They're just mad that if you don't cancel someone in today's society, then it, it's just can't, like, I know people talk about cancel culture and how crazy it is, yeah. and, but it's still happening. You know what's really funny? Doesn't Kim Kardashian sound a lot like Kanye West when she speaks about cancel culture? You could tell they've been together for a very long time, right? She's starting to sound a lot like him. And there's this bit in the beginning of this interview where she speaks about how she likes her houses to be minimal um, and to have, you know, and to be mono- monochromatic and whatnot. And she likes her staff to wear a certain uniform um, in terms of the certain color palettes they wear. That's all Kanye West playbook. That's something that he has enforced in every place or every space that he's worked in from day dot. It's something he's always kind of been really sensitive to. Certain smells, lights, sounds. He's kind of very finicky and picky about these kind of things. But she didn't mention that's something that he got from Kanye, but definitely that's something that she got from him. Obviously, it maybe lends to her way of life because if you are if you have so much chaos and um you know unpredictability outside of your home it would make sense why you'd have want to have so much control on everything that goes on inside of your home fair enough but anyway go back to the cancer culture point of view she has a very similar opinion to kanye in cancer culture and Kanye's a pressure of cancer culture i feel like it's a little bit naive and a little bit infantile in that he doesn't think anybody should ever get cancelled ever and that and when i mean ev- ever i mean you can see the evidence of it he you know famously said bill cosby innocent i would imagine he probably has some spicy takes concerning people like r kelly harvey weinstein he obviously put his arm around the shoulder of somebody like a you know, marilyn manson when he brought him out to donda 2 concert he obviously did the same thing with the baby and he was going through his issues with the comments that he made i think at coachella or whatnot or i think it may be rolling loud um he clearly has a very strange and kind of counterculture um, or counter, yeah, kind of counter opinion of what cancel culture should be and what it should kind of look like. And in his eyes, no one should be get, no one should be cancelled. Everyone should be forgiven, and all this sort of nonsense stuff that he has out there. My opinion of it is that I'm also along the lines of like I don't think a network or studios should 
be cancelling people. I think that heavy-handed approach of coming in and basically taking someone's ability to make money and be successful in the industry is crazy. And look at what happened to Six Nine. And like him or not, you know, he's abhorrent. Obviously, what he did in terms of you know snitching on his fellow gang members and putting people behind bars and you know basically, I think he snitched on maybe ten plus people or something crazy like that. Having actively took on part in crimes himself was egregious. Even if he thinks they smashed his baby mum or whatever, I think it was totally unacceptable. But that doesn't that did that shouldn't impact the decision making process that digital streaming platforms have in terms of hosting his music on their playlist. That shouldn't be what it's about. It should be about the music. Your stuff you do outside of music shouldn't affect their decision to put you on a playlist or to not promote your stuff on the pages and whatnot. That's not how it should work. It should never ever be like that. And I feel like the fact that they do that, that is essentially what I don't like about council culture. They come in and they basically put you in a corner where you can't be successful. Is basically, you know, come in heavy handed and sort of cancel your, your your career that way. And I've never really been a fan of that sort of stuff at all, zero. When it comes back to this point of view that she's having, Kim, no one was trying to, no one I don't think with any kind of mind or sane mind was sitting there thinking what Kim would say would result in Balenciaga being counted. That's not ever going to happen. We know that's going to be a fact. If the Balenciaga didn't get rid of them now, or they didn't, you know, adequately accept responsibility for the fact that they put that shoot together, because remember at first they tried to blame the production company, the photographer, everyone but themselves for that shoot, you know, being put together. If that was the case, when that happened, we know for sure that these celebrities or these brand ambassadors for Balenciaga, whatever they say isn't going to affect how Balenciaga does as a company, as a stock, whatever maybe that's never going to happen that way. But what we expected from Kim, I think, as regular humans, was that her being a mum, especially a new, a newly mum, whatever that term is, right? Um, you would expect her to maybe have a different view, maybe a more nuanced, or maybe even a more aggressive view. Like maybe because you spent so much time just looking after yourself and you being the center of the universe. Now you have all these children around you who you would imagine are the center of your universe now. You'd be hyper, super protective of kids overall. Just the idea of them because you know how much you love yours. And you might be like, you know what? I know this is, this is irrational and this is emotional and I'm probably being a little bit knee-jerk and reactive, but I'm going to draw my line in the sand and say, I'm not going to stand with Blin Sugar just because of what they've done with the kids thing. That's what people expected. Something a bit more, some strong words to come out off the back of that. But when you got that kind of vague, um, almost, you know, leave the door open kind of statement regarding her relationship with Balenciaga, and let you know, oh, these people don't have souls. They don't have any morals, any principles, any ethics whatsoever. And as long as somebody's giving them the bag, they're willing to make any and every excuse to keep that relationship going. And that's what we basically saw. So it wasn't we wanted her to cancel Blaine Sugar. She's not going to power to cancel Blaine Sugar. Let's be real. But we just expected something more. We expected like the mum to come out of her. And I guess the mum doesn't exist when you're a Hollywood celebrity or when you're, you know, one of the biggest influencers or the biggest influencer in the world. There is no such thing as a mum. But it's still happening. And so it's never been my place. Yeah. The whole point of life is to make mistakes, is to grow and to evolve and mm -hmm. to be better people. Obviously, there Can you make mistakes when it involves kids? We all have to have line in the signs, isn't it? We all have to have them. I've said it myself. My line in the sign is going to be rape. My line in the sand will be stuff involving children. Legitimately. If some one of my friends did something involving murder, I would legitimately have to ask the sit I'd have to ask for the details surrounding it. Because if it was imagine if it was your friend murdered somebody, God forbid, who did something untoward to a relative of theirs. You would maybe have to understand where their mind frame was at and the situation the circumstances around it. There might be some context to it that might make it somewhat justifiable because i'm a big believer in eye for an eye i don't believe any of this sort of like forgiveness nonsense i'm not in that game whatsoever which is why for the most part i leave people alone because i don't know how far i'm willing to go to to right the wrongs that have happened to me so i don't want anybody to get i mean i, I just don't want none of that energy around me so i just kind of leave everybody alone and i mind my business but when it involves kids and when it involves rape you're dead to me like we're never going to be friends again business is finished whatever it's done that's a wrap that's my line of sand. Everyone has theirs. And it just sounds like to her, <laughs> there's no line in the sand. Like everything is forgivable. But they're not even Christian. 
it'll be it'll be fine if it was a, from a religious point of view, right? The Bible teaches me that everybody is created equal under the eyes of God, and everyone's gonna be forgiven. And this idea that Jesus, well, Christ was, you know, the one that would go to like whorehouses and try to, you know, save them and save, you know, homeless people in the street and drug dealers and criminals. Cool, whatever, do your thing. But if you're just a regular everyday person and you happen to have a family and somebody in the family ends up doing something involving kids or somebody you're doing business with ends up doing something untowards involving children, you would imagine that would be your line of sense to be like, I can't deal with you anymore. That is it. We're done. Because I know every time I think of anything involving kids, I can't help but picture my own kids. It's not something I think of like, because me, I'm thinking of it abstractly. But if you have your own kids, I'd imagine, especially if it's the same thing if you have pets. As soon as you have your first pet, suddenly anything involving animal cruelty you get super sensitive about because you can't imagine anybody trying to harm such a defenseless love um love filled creature that that you kind of call a member of your family right somebody that you kind of um humanize in some way shape or form so how, how much more for children there is absolutely no place or an ounce to even play with anything with children mm -hmm. like any sexualization of children there's like not an ounce of that in our should be in our brains and in our society mm -hmm. i get that i couldn't <laughs> have been more clear on this is horrifying this is these this is disturbing i mean but unless they heard what they wanted to hear is like fuck you you're canceled don't you feel like though isn't there a part of you that feels like no matter what you say or no matter what you said, that there's just, there will be people who have a problem with whatever version of response you have to a Balenciaga or to something, you know, Kanye might say, or don't you feel like you can't win or? Totally. Yeah. You, you definitely can't win. Yeah. No matter what, you can't win, but yeah. I'll still be me. Yeah. I just think that my, this week was just really testing for me just because I'm in so much other shit that's not my shit. Me. And that is like, I just, you know, when you just don't want to be a part of the narrative, but you're brought in. Yeah. But then I have I to even... take responsibility and say, okay, people look at me as the face of this. So let me, let me speak out. Mm -hmm. I just always want to do the right thing. And you always have to just do what feels right. Mm -hmm. And you just can't, take on all that extra energy mm -hmm. whole bunch of nothing whole bunch of nothing but again she kind of said it herself at the end there people see me as the face of this thing so i have to maybe step up and say something because i i can sympathize in the point of view of like i had this podcast where essentially i forced myself to have hot takes and stuff that i generally probably don't care about but to make an interesting show, you kind of just have to force yourself to kind of have a hot take or to have something to say about something that happened in culture. I can understand from her point of view, being in a, it being a place where, you know what, I do so much on social. The last thing I want to do is contribute on top of the stuff that I contribute to on social with my opinions on things that are happening that don't even concern me. Because if it's concerning me, it's already annoying because people extrapolate and you know, and sort of like read into things that probably aren't even there. But how much worse would it be for Kim if she decided to weigh into all these things happening in culture, right? When it becomes relationships, family, all this. We already see what happened when she started to talk about hard work and stuff and how did the internet react so negatively towards it. It just isn't going to win. You're not going to win. It's not going to work. So I understand. Sympathize for that point of view. But by the same token, you can't understand, oh, people see you as Balenciaga's face and then also get annoyed when people don't, when people try to ask you for a response or push you to respond to things that involves children, when you're out there on the internet all the time trying to LARP as a single mom of four, you kind of have to expect that. And also, people maybe expected, again, a more visceral response, and we didn't get it because they're soulless. And that's okay. That's okay also because I think the, the more mature you become in life, the more um, life experiences you end up having, the sooner you probably realize that this thing that they do is a talent and a skill in itself. You know, you already know, I know for myself how difficult it is to self-promote, how difficult it is for me to record a vlog with a camera in my hand outside talking to myself in the streets. I know how difficult it is to keep uploading fucking videos of myself DJing on social media and how cringe it feels to basically be this dancing monkey and show, look, look how cool I am, look how cool I am. It doesn't come naturally to any of us who are quote-unquote normal. 
but to them to people who do exist on social media who do think of themselves as a weird modern version of royalty this comes natural it is part of part of their life so i can understand where in order to kind of be at the zenith at the top at the pinnacle of where they are you can't have a soul you can't have um any part of you be like a regular human you just can't it just can't exist i think there's an interview she says one bit where oh my kids are amazing they're just like regular people they're regular ki-. like she just keeps saying something about their how normal they are how normal they are and i can really em- empathize with that's probably the realest moment like she says something actual like a real thing because it probably shocks her that these kids have come out so normal despite her being so lacking in her soul and being so dead behind the eyes because she has to be that way in order to kind of do the job that she's doing right or to kind of fulfill this destiny that she has to become the most famous person in the world wherever it may be this is part and parcel of her life you can't have a soul and do that job because it would just weigh you down and it would not allow you to do the things that she's done because you'd be second guessing yourself or be thinking that's cringe that's corny that's lame that's a bit ott what message am i sending nah there is no message there is no sending you just do what you do you cash your checks and you keep it going so that makes complete sense but god almighty god almighty the lack of um the lack of self-awareness is pretty frightening the lack of um understanding is really weird as well especially when you consider this woman's like in her 40s or something you're like god oh my why so you have no idea why people were pushing you for a comment regarding the blend sugar kids bdsm toy things like no idea it does it does involve me okay cool it doesn't involve you no worries that's that's the only reason why you shouldn't be talking about it because it doesn't involve you yeah yeah, yeah. Cool, cool, cool anyway moving on moving on Okay, so moving on, there's this really interesting article that's come out the other day regarding nepotism in the entertainment industry at large that's been doing the rounds. Everyone's been going really, really crazy about. And it's got a really cool cover here, as you can see, via Vulture. If you're just reading or listening, sorry, to the podcast, it's essentially a cover featuring all these different nepotism babies and they basically superimpose their heads onto the bodies of babies in in hospital somewhere so it's really really cool like a collage of all these little different nepotism babies that cover the remit in terms of the entertainment industry and this article has obviously been really interesting to see the people and the connections that they have in industry and you know what that may or may have done to their career going forward and just the conversations around how that plays a role in the success of some people's careers or how far it can take in your career but I think the conversations around that have been even more interesting when you think of people like Jamie Lee Curtis, right? She had a very, I feel like, um, tone deaf somewhat and missing the point um, comment regarding it. But I also think it's valid considering her connections and how she's kind of come up through the industry. So I'm going to quickly read up, read on that and kind of comment on some of the bits and bobs that I thought about as well in the process. So the headline courtesy of Variety says as follows, Jamie Lee Curtis, I am an OG Nipper baby and the Nipper baby discourse is designed to degenerate and hurt. Which, you know, a little bit lame, but hey, let's go down to the, the post itself. She posted on Instagram with some cool pictures of her and her family back in the day. Um, as you can see there, let's scan across and see some other cute pictures of her while she was growing up and whatnot. So, you know, some nice things there, as you can see. Anyway, scroll down. Okay, so this is taken from Jamie Lee Curtis's Instagram account. So let's actually read the caption here in full because I think it has some very interesting points that I'm going to push back against. So she says as follows. I have been a professional actress since I was 19 years old. So that makes me an OG nipper baby. I never understood, nor will I, what qualities got me hired that day. But since my first two lines on Quincy as a contact player at University Studios to his last spectacular creative year, some 44 years later, there's not a day in my professional life that goes by without my being reminded that I'm a daughter of movie stars. Which makes sense because the movie stars you were daughters also flipping some of the greatest ever to grace the big screen. So that makes complete sense. So um let's continue anyway let's just not lull on that one for a bit the current conversation about nipper babies is just designed to try to diminish and degenerate and hurt not really though it's more for understanding i think for the longest time people didn't really understand how some of the biggest kind of power players in the industries that you kind of want to work especially entertainment all these type of stuff like arts and whatnot where there is no kind of clear path to get from point a to point b to point b c to point d it is quite 
important and informative to understand that sometimes you're not running the same race as everybody else. So sometimes when you feel like you've, you know, you've been going to a million auditions and nothing's ever going for you, and this one person got five and then suddenly landed some big movie role, it's good to understand that maybe this person got that role partly because of their talent, but also because they've got these connections. So it could either allow you to push forward and try to, you know, um, beat people like that who already got all the advantages in life or to be somewhat content in understanding that your journey might be a bit longer because you don't have those connections that's mainly what it's about it's not really a, it's not really i don't see anybody out there saying this nipper baby or that nipper baby is only there because of the connections they have and they have no talent whatsoever no one's saying that everyone's just saying that hey the connections that you have and the you know connections the family you're born into have definitely played a role in getting you where you are it doesn't mean it plays the entire role but it plays a role but then nipper babies for some reason they're very defensive um despite some of them being very well connected to the point where it's like yeah you were destined for greatness it'd actually be a disappointment if you didn't turn out to be an amazing actor musician or whatever maybe given your genes um which i never understood like anyway let's just continue because it's just to me it's mind-boggling why you'd even argue against it to be completely honest but i guess i guess if someone's trying to diminish your entire success based on things that you can't control like the family you're born into i can understand it but let's be honest as well there's such um abundance of people who want to be actors who want to be directors screenwriters djs musicians rappers producers there's too many of them and not enough roles or jobs or labels for them to get signed onto or podcast networks there's just not enough not enough ears or time in a day this is all the podcast doesn't exist so those small differentials to kind of get you there make they matter. Do you know what I mean? Like having the connections, being born certain thing, knowing certain people here, they're going to they're gonna make the real difference because if we're all doing podcasts and if we're all of a certain level, then there's only going to be those small differences that allow us to kind of get to the next step. And some of them may be the idea that, hey, I know somebody at the New York Times that can interview me and make it seem like I'm a far bigger deal than what I am that might allow me to then go get a brand deal that then might allow me to go get this guest that they may allow me to go get this job. Like, like those things are matter, but it doesn't mean that the work that I did prior with just my RSS feed and the tape recorder doesn't matter. But those connections did help me to get further. Do you understand what I mean? You get what I mean? Yeah, we get what I mean. Anyway, it continues. For the record, I have navigated 44 years with the advantages my associated and reflected fame brought me. I don't pretend there aren't any that try to tell me that I have no value on my own. It's curious how we immediately make assumptions and snide remarks that someone related to somebody who, el who uh, someone else who is famous in their field for their art would somehow have no talent whatsoever. No one's saying that. I, there might be some people that say that, but no one with any kind of sense is saying that if you're born in a family, by proxy, by default, if you're born into a family with people who are already successful in the field that you want to be in, you're going to have some level of talent just by default because you've just been around it for so long, right? It's just one that you're just going to take to it a little easier than maybe your average person would. You may just show a natural acumen to it. You may not be good at, good at it. That's another thing. But you may just be, you may just be able to handle stuff like spotlight and questions and whatever it may be a lot easier than some people you may not enjoy it it may be a chore whatever it may be but that is you know that's a given that's a given but i don't think anyone is legitimately saying just because you're born into a family you don't have any talent because that doesn't make any sense the fact that you're born from these two people's dna who are very successful means that you have some talent but again we continue uh ba -da -ba -da -ba. i have come to learn that it's simply not true i have suited up and shown up for all different kinds of work with thousands and thousands of people every day i've tried to bring integrity professionalism and love and community and art to my work i am not alone there are many of us dedicated to our craft proud of our lineage strong in our belief in our right to exist so in these difficult days of so much rage in the world can we just try to find a quiet voice that brilliant movie everything everywhere all at once remind us and my friend robbie nolan studio reminds us not to self be kind be kind be kind yeah all this woo -woo shit is one thing but the realities of life are completely different i'm sorry but it's just not again like i don't understand why you'd want to like i'm really interested to know because it's kind of similar to the whole kim thing right because i feel like in my opinion again it's just my impression i feel like Kim especially or the new version of the Kardashians now 
is that they kind of all want to laugh as mothers, especially the ones that have kids, um, or especially the ones that are kind of newlywed or whatever it may be. They want to laugh as mothers, like I want to keep my family together. Da da da. Fact they were taking pictures of together, their family, all this sort of shit, right, with their kids and stuff, and you kind of want to laugh as a hardworking mum or a single mum or whatever it may be. But the reality is you don't face the same struggles every day that regular mums who have kids have to balance careers, professional ambitions, um, social media stuff they want to do, whatever. Because I'm sure those mums exist, right? The mums who work nine to five, but also want to be on social media and be an influencer on there. But also have to look after the kids and also want to date and also want to travel and meet new people. All these things are the challenges they're having to face. This is far more difficult because they don't have unlimited resources as maybe the Kardashians have. So it's a bit of an insult to those ladies. They're trying to lap and kind of, kind of, you know, trying to, um, trying to, uh, trying to lap and trying to sort of like use their struggle as a, as a sort of personality trait. It's very strange, very bizarre to me. In the same way, a Nipah baby will go out of their way to let you know that their lineage had nothing to do with where they are, when really it has everything to do with where they are, because the industry is so competitive that those little margins where you can get someone to recommend you or you can maybe do a private reading or whatever it may be, whatever it may be, just an introduction of a coffee, whatever, all those things make a big difference. We know it because we know how competitive industries are. I think of myself in the industry that I'm kind of in when it comes to DJing and whatnot. There are a lot of people who've clearly made it off the back of their talent only alone, but there's no denying there are a certain group of people who have also made it because of the connections they have in the industry and the being able to sort of parlay certain relationships, certain friendships you have with people and sort of use that to your advantage. That is no, there's no shame in that. That's what you should be doing it for. But to insult our collective intelligence and tell us that isn't important or it didn't play a role in your success is again, insulting to the nth degree. Because what it does is that it lets people know that there is no like, there is no difference in struggle when there clearly is. Again, it's not struggle with Olympics, but there is a difference if you're uh, a young girl in your mid-20s, you just dropped out of university and you want to try and get in the movies and you're having to do auditions in between breaks at working in some coffee shop somewhere. Number one, you can't take as many breaks to go and audition anyway because you might lose your job, right? And this is the only job that you have, even though it pays crap and the tips are horrible. So you're having to balance all these things and these struggles they're having. Maybe you're trying to go back to college to make your mum and dad happy. Maybe you've got a, a boyfriend that's that's thinking, you, you know, you're not paying enough attention to him and that you're all about your career. And that's putting a strain on it. Maybe you haven't seen your friends in ages. All these things are, are kind of playing in the back of your head before you've even stepped foot into the audition room. Whereas if you're a nipper baby or you come from a privileged background where you don't have to worry about those kind of things, so your parents are paying your rent and your car note and shit, it could make you have a far better audition because legitimately you have nothing weighing you down in your head. You have none of these struggles that are in the back of your head or on your back in general. You just go in there and do the job and maybe, you know, drop a name or two and suddenly you've got the role. Those things matter and they make, you know, they make a difference. Of course, it can work the other way around. I don't know for myself, all the, the more struggles I have in life, the more I'm trying to hustle outside the things that I'm wanting to do. It can kind of spur me on to go really full tilt at my dreams and to try my best to try and achieve them because I know I don't want to go back to the hellhole that I've just left. I understand it. But let's not be insulting. We know these connections make a difference. We're just not saying it's the be and end all, but we know it. And I think there are a certain group of nipper babies now, the newer generation ones, I feel like, especially the ones who don't have like glitzy parents, but they have parents who, or family members or, you know, people that they know who actually work in the business, who are shot callers. Maybe they're executive producers, maybe they're screenwriters, maybe they're directors, maybe they work for a particular uh, production company, whatever it may be. Those are the people who really go out of their way to not even tell you because they know, they know deep down that that made a real difference. Because maybe it's, maybe you can say if your dad is Johnny Depp or something, it, it's not going to go as far as you maybe want it to go because he maybe doesn't have actual connections behind the scenes to kind of get you the job that you want. But if your dad is a, you know, is a flipping 30 year veteran of Hollywood, and he's worked in the lighting departments of ER, um, also Grey's Anatomy, um, Friends, and all these type of things for years and years. And he knows all the big, he, like he's just, a, a, he's just like he's part of the fabric of the industry. Of course, you're gonna find it easier to get into the industry because that person can legitimately get you a job. 
as opposed to maybe the more glitzy sort of shiny um, nippo babies that exist out there but I don't know. I, I feel like this whole thing is just insulting to everybody's intelligence because we know there are talent nipper babies that exist. What, the one that comes to mind straight away is Lena Dunham from Girls. Like that woman is incredibly talented. Clearly, from what she did online, from what she did with Girls, you can definitely tell that that's somebody that was destined to always be a kind of a voice for her generation in terms of the ability to kind of you know craft these amazing stories about these girls, kind of trying to make it in bustling new york and their kind of various struggles that they have and and whatever and just kind of representing you know womanhood and girlhood in that particular time of life fair enough and she's kind of been able to capture you know capture it all on that tv show girls amazing but there's no denying also the fact that she does come from a family that maybe affords her the ability to take more chances that it can give you the ability to become successful and become a Leonard Dunham. <laughs> to be honest this whole debate is gay anyway to me it's all gay because i'm sure as much as I'm arguing against it, I'm sure there are some people out there who legitimately use the whole nipper baby discourse as an opportunity to just kind of make excuses for their lack of success in their own life. I'm sure they do exist. Saying, oh, see, I could, I, that's why I haven't made it as this or that because there's all these people in here who've got all these connections, all this sort of stuff that I don't have and that's how they made it. It's like, no. There's always going to be people who quote-unquote cheat the system who get given shortcuts, who get given advantages that you're never going to have. That's always going to exist in any walk of life. It doesn't matter what it is. It's always going to exist. Um, it's actually a far better story to try and overcome those sort of things. But I guess the just insulting part of it, it's like somebody who's the son of the CEO pretending like they got the job as the, you know, as the flipping general manager or flipping, you know, whatever company they're working at, just on the strength of their ability to do the work. That's the assaulting part of it. It's like, yeah, cool. You might be good at what you do, but let's also not deny that you're only here at the age of 21 leading a group of men who are, you know, could all be your dad because your dad is basically gave you the job. That's essentially what people are saying. But, you know, I don't know, maybe it's just a natural human tendency to always try and defend yourself. Uh, but I just can't understand if I was Nipper Baby, why I'd want to come out and try and argue the fact that my parents didn't play a role in my success, because clearly they did. Like, why wouldn't they? That's the whole point of being that lucky and that fortunate to be given the blessing of being born into a family with that kind of lineage and influence. You should be using it to your advantage. Why wouldn't you? Um, and trying to argue against it makes no sense. If anything, the more work that you put out there sooner rather than later, um, the whole fact that you're a Nipper Baby won't matter anymore. But engaging that conversation fighting against it, uh, trying to insult people's intelligence, it doesn't end well. We already saw what happened with the Lily Rose Depp girl and how that kind of backfired on her. And I feel like in general, these younger kids coming up should just let it lie, man. Let it lie. It is what it is. Your dad happens to be the director of communications at some amazing production company, which ends up getting you an internship to work on fucking Euphoria, you know, before you, you know, at the age of 17, take that advantage that you've been given work your ass off and then use it to propel you and do other things outside of what your dad can give you. But don't sit there and deny and act like you didn't get that job because of your parents. You obviously did, but use it to your advantage now and use it as a jumping off point to do other things that you can kind of quote unquote earn on, off your own sweat of your brow because that's super important also part of life. I feel like maybe just going through life and knowing deep down that you're only in the position that you're at because of the friends and because of the connections you have, it maybe can make you feel away there can there can be a bit of a imposter syndrome there because imagine you, you have imposter syndrome when you when you've generally done the work right and you feel like you're legit and you're solidified you have imposter syndrome imagine how you must feel if you've come from a family with an incredible lineage and connections and you've been coasting through life doing the bare minimum and now suddenly here you are director of communication at fucking cbs like i can imagine that being a little bit hard to deal with internally and then when someone points it out you can be a bit defensive straight away because you already feel bad about yourself anyway but 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 if you use it as it's meant to be used as a blessing to give you the ability to do other things and to take more chance that's where you end up winning it might be that's where you end up winning but you know what do i know what do i know anyway that has been the excellent thing show episode number what 634 thanks again for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual if it's the first time tuning into a show you know what to do smash like hit subscribe leave me a comment down below if you listen to the podcast app you can find the link to my website actionzinger.com to see all the stuff that i'm doing i've currently got two dj mixes out at the moment 
Um, I got one that I meant to be doing or entered in for the mix mag cause light competition that I didn't enter in on time and I didn't late. I just put it up anyway. So check that out. It's more of a housey type of vibe. And I've also got a test mix. I can't even say it properly. I've also got a test mix number sixty three. Those are mixes that I do usually once per week, but you know I've been kind of slacking where I essentially try and recreate what I would have played in a club night because usually I don't have the ability to play as often as I would like to post-pandemic or for other reasons, who knows. But I want to kind of practice and get kind of back in that kind of flow. So I do these text mix uh, I put out there. So definitely check out my test mix number 63. I'll put the link actually in the show notes so you can definitely check it out. It's definitely one of my more fun ones I put out there. A lot of techno, a lot of electro type of vibes, a lot of acid. So if you're into that sort of stuff definitely check it out and i'll be doing those more going forward but that has been the excellent zing show episode number 634 if you're listening to the audio version of the show you will hear my tune of the day and if you're watching this via video only it will go and fade to black and i'll see you guys again very soon take care peace <laughs>